Forty-five states now permit television cameras in the courtroom. And Court Television, launched in July 1991, hopes that soon cameras will be permitted in all courts. Court TV spends every day covering newsworthy trials in state and federal courts around the country, sometimes live, sometimes taped and aired in long segments their extended coverage and analysis gives viewers an inside look at defendants, prosecutors, and their juries, allowing them to draw their own conclusions about the trials themselves and about how the system works in general. Good morning, I'm Fred Graham. Welcome to the Courtroom Television Network. The philosopher Henry David Thoreau once observed that circumstantial evidence can be very convincing such as, he said, when you find a trout in the milk. Still, it's rare that murder cases are brought to trial based solely on circumstantial evidence, that is, evidence from which you can deduce that the defendant did it with no evidence linking him directly to the crime. But sometimes the circumstances are so persuasive that prosecutors decide to go to trial with them, and that is the situation in the case that begins on court TV today. You know, there used to be a uh tradition in this country that people in small towns would go down to the square and they'd just sit in the courtroom and uh, for entertainment and to find out what was going on in their community. And uh, that doesn't happen much anymore, but we hope that we can carry out a video age restoration of that uh, tradition of just going down to the courtroom and watching the trials. A little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing, but more knowledge is less dangerous by definition. The more knowledge that people can get through television, through the radio, through books, through newspapers about law, courts, legislatures, Congress, hearings. The more they know, the better off we are as a democracy. The more informed the judgments will be. Uh, they will know when there are dangers lurking on the horizon. Uh, they will know that they are not powerless to stop these things. Uh, I yield three minutes to the gentleman from Indiana. The gentleman from Indiana is recognized for three minutes. Mr. Speaker, I think... The more citizens learn about their institutions and the people that are running them, the less likely there is to be abuses in those institutions. People who function behind a cloak of secrecy, who are not in the spotlight, can uh, develop very narrow, insular interests, can fall into abuses. So things like um, court TV, C-SPAN, they throw the spotlight on these institutions. I yield five minutes to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Henry. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized for five minutes. C-SPAN was established in 1979 by the cable television industry as a service to the public. Its mission, to provide live gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the House of Representatives. The viewer is given a front row seat 24 hours a day to the workings of Congress, unfiltered and without interruption, analysis, or commentary. In 1986, sessions of the Senate began airing in their entirety on a second channel, C-SPAN 2. One of our missions is to give the opportunity to the public to become educated. Uh, we, we think our mission out here all the time. We're not crusaders. We're not trying to change democracy. Uh, we're not trying to change the American system of government. We're just trying to take what the American system has created and make it available to anyone who's interested. And if they, uh, if they become educated, great. Uh, if they become frustrated, that's fine. Uh, it might move them to do something about it. It might move them to go to the polls. In a way, uh, the electronic age um, fulfills a basic dream of the Founding Fathers, or, or at least uh, some of the Founding Fathers who believe very much in a direct link between the governed and the governing. Defying the conventional television wisdom that there would be little public interest, C-SPAN created a demand for gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of committee hearings and floor debates on Capitol Hill. Today they reach over 50 million subscribers nationwide. I think there's some who would have rolled the dice at 6 p.m. The more informed you are, the more at ease you are when the decisions are made, even if you don't agree with them, because you had a chance to watch the discussion. 
You had a chance to watch the way the reasoning came together. And it's no longer just a headline in the newspaper. It's not everybody's cup of tea. But for those folks far away from here, this is the first time they've had an opportunity to actually see the process unfold in front of their eyes. The uh, electronic media age is still rather young as world history goes. I think we are on the brink of people beginning to realize those people who are involved in it, they seem like ordinary folks just like me. They don't seem any more able than I, any more possessed of God's wisdom than I am. Maybe I could do it too, but it's just beginning to dawn on them. And I foresee that as the electronic uh, media age matures, that people will begin to participate more, will begin to vote. Right now, they're in the sort of spectator stage, but I think that leads to participation. But we are also facing a decision. There's no doubt in my mind that we are the freest country in the world after looking at other major governments in depth. And there are a lot of reasons for us being free, but there are a lot of people that take it for granted. And it's important that uh, more people understand how the whole thing comes together so that we continue to reinforce and protect what we've already been able to build, build as a country. In my view, knowledge and democracy are inextricably linked. Um, you cannot have a fair and just democracy without knowledge, knowledge on the part of the citizens and on the part of the legislators. As James Madison said in 1822, and he made this link very explicit, and he said it perhaps better than anyone, he said, and I quote, a popular government without popular information or the means of acquiring it is but a prologue to farce or tragedy, or perhaps both. Knowledge will forever govern ignorance and a people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power which knowledge gives.